everyone in the VC. Hope you're having a good weekend. Check that out. 60 years in business in record town in Fort Worth. Finally got t-shirts made for their for the record store. So I picked one of those up today. There's other stuff on the back, but I don't feel like turning around. So I'll show it to you some other time. But uh, hey, hope everyone's having a good weekend. And I just wanted to check in and continue along with my series Beach Boys reviews in order of release. And so we get... Uh, come today to the band's 1979 masterpiece LA or light album there's the cover each of these uh, pictures or paintings or whatever you want to call it is supposed to represent uh, the different songs on the album kind of silly nonsense there for the cover not a very not the best cover but it's not the best album so I guess it's fitting here's um, inner sleeve some pictures of the band, some information of who plays on what and who painted these goofy pictures. So, yeah, um, that's probably so far. There's some albums ahead of this that I haven't heard yet, but uh, so far, and listening to the Beach Boys albums from all the way back in 1962 to now to this point, this has got to be the worst one that I've heard yet. Um, so the band had a great 60s, great run of 60s albums. Of course, there's the the great masterpiece, Pet Sounds, one of uh, Joe, me and Mr. Mayo's favorite favorite albums of all time. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of good stuff before that, and there's a lot of good stuff after that. There's a really rich period from uh, 1967 up through 1973 with Holland. Then there's a little bit of a fallback with 76's uh, 15 Big Ones, which been great but has its moments return to form 77 with love you great album maybe the last great album i don't know we'll see because like i said there's albums that i still haven't heard ahead of this one ahead of light album i'm thinking they're not going to be uh, as good as the things that came before them i'm almost positive they're not but we'll find out uh, and then there was uh miu which was uh one last one that I reviewed from 1978 and I wasn't looking forward to that because I was thinking it was gonna really stink and uh, it's not a good album but it's better than I expected it to be and it does have some moments it's hardly great this one um, and I'm thinking from here on out things are gonna pretty much go downhill for the most part for the albums ahead and this one goes downhill quite a bit um, but even having said that, it's not without a few moments, and so we'll get into the songs here in a minute. So it's called L.A., or The Light Album, came out on March 19th of 1979, and was a huge hit for the band. It flew all the way up to the number 100 spot on the Billboard charts in the United States. Did a little better in England, went to number 32. It's the band's first record on CBS Records, first album on CBS Records, they'd signed a new contract and changed labels yet again. Bruce Johnston is back in the fold after having missed most of the 70s. He was brought in, uh, CBS wanted, hoped for and wanted, just like all the labels before, that Brian Wilson would be more involved, write more songs, take a bigger hand in production. And, Brian's not in a very good place at this point, and so that didn't happen. He's really not on this album very much, so Bruce was brought in to help with production on this album. Uh, Brian, as a matter of fact, he's uh, he, no lead vocals on this album, unfortunately. He he's, uh, sings on one song, at least, probably just the one song, and he plays piano, maybe a little bit of bass here and there, but he's largely absent. Another thing about this album, uh, another un sad and unfortunate thing, is this is, uh, I believe, I could be wrong here, but I think this is the last Beach Boys album with Dennis Wilson penned songs. Uh, he might, uh, the 1980 album that I'll get to, that'll be the next one up because this is 1979, the 1980 album, he is on that, I believe. He might have some vocals and play some drums, but I don't think he wrote any songs for that one. And then, of course, by the time of their album after 1980, came out in 85, he had sadly uh, passed away. 
So, um, yeah, this is uh, even even 15 big ones in MIU. I can find some some things to like on them, and I can find a few things to like on this. But this is significantly poorer than MIU or 15 big ones, and those are pretty bad albums, truth be told. Uh, this is uh, not classic Beach Boys by any any stretch of the imagination. And even though there are some good songs, there's no jump out at you classic. Uh, I don't know if I was putting together just a, a compilation of Beach Boys songs. I don't know that there'd be, there might be one song, maybe two songs I'd pick from this, but there might be none. So yeah, let's get, get on with it. Uh, there are, uh, I think, uh, oh, there's uh, ten songs on here, I believe. So the first song, Outside One, is called Good Timing. It's written by Brian and Carl. Uh, this is really the only song that Brian has a writing credit on this album. There's one other, but it doesn't really count. We'll get to that in a minute. Written by Brian and Carl. Carl sings lead. Brian sings some of the backup, I believe. It's a, it's a nice, breezy... Uh, upbeat song with sort of lush vocals and harmonies, sort of that classic Beach Boy feel. It's a nice enough song, it's a nice enough opener, but the problem with it is it, it just seems a little bit forced. It seems like they're trying a little too hard to recapture the old magic and the old feel of the classic Beach Boy songs that came so easy to them once upon a time and that, that ability at this point is slipped away or is really starting to slip away from them so it's it's sort of a retread of earlier classic Beach Boy sound it, it works nice enough it's, an, it's a nice enough song but it's certainly not close somewhat close to the real thing but not the real thing I guess and so uh, but it's a nice opener the lyrics are kinda weak nothing really spectacular there um, it's not a bad song. I'm going to give it a seven. It's just, it's nothing to write home about. Okay, so the second song is called Lady Linda. That was uh, written by Al Jardine and uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, which is kind of odd given that Bach passed away in 1750, but um, Jardine incorporates the melody from Bach's Joy of Man's Desiring into the opening and closing of the track. So, that's why Bach gets a credit there. Uh, Lady Linda, Linda was uh, Jardine's wife at the time, so it was written in tribute to her. Later on, they got divorced, and Jardine re-recorded the song, I, I guess on a solo album or on a later Beach Boys album, as Lady Liberty, as a tribute to the Statue of Liberty. Um, yeah, Lady Linda, it's a, it's a pleasant, sort of an adult, contemporary-sounding song. This is... Uh, this album came out in 1979. Like I said, I would have been about 15. I wouldn't. I would have thought this song really blew chunks. If I, I, I don't remember hearing it when it came out back in 79, but I would have thought this song really stunk. And it would have been kind of the sort of music that if you were 15 and 79, and your kind of music your mom would have liked, is that sort of bland adult contemporary sound to it. Now that I'm old, it's, um, well, it's really not that much better now either. A pleasant, nice, sort of dull song. I'll give it a four, though. Okay, so things look up a little bit with song number three, which is called Full Sail. It's a song written by Carl and sung by Carl, which is always good. Um, you know, Carl's probably the best vocalist in the band. And so it's a song of sort of longing and mourning. Um, got really nice vocals. Um, it's got that sort of 70s liquid piano keyboard sound that was so endemic in, I don't know, a lot of the like late 70s uh, kind of adult contemporary Billy Joel type songs and things like that, which is a bit annoying and very dated and wasn't that great back in 1979, but it's got great vocal by Carl. It's a pretty nice song. It's pretty. It's uh, Lyrically, it's not that exciting, 
Uh, song short, it's only two minutes and fifty six seconds, but it seems longer than that. But uh, it, it's I'll give it a six. I'll go a six on that. So it's, it's certainly um, certainly better than Lady Linda. Song number four is called Angel Come Home. It's another song written by Carl and it's sung by Dennis. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, another a step up here from what came before. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, I don't know if he's singing about someone that's passed away that he's missing or someone that's just simply gone, like a wife that ran off or a girlfriend that broke up with him. But um, it's... Uh, it's good as the first song on the album that finally has some some balls to it, and some actual emotion, re realistic emotion instead of just sort of plastic, uh, breezy lyrics. Um, it's a good song, but again, this kind of what plagues this album is that this is a nice song. It's probably the best song so far on the album. Uh, yeah, uh, but it's. Uh, it's nice, but it's not essential or classic. It's not, in the end, all that exciting. It's, but 7.5, it is It is a good song. Okay, we get to uh, song number five, which is called Love Surrounds Me. It's a Dennis song, uh, written by Dennis, sung by Dennis. This is one of the songs that was um, meant for his second solo album, Bamboo which ended up never coming out in his lifetime. It was released posthumously. Uh, so yeah, Love Surrounds Me. Um, got the aching lost vocals that was typical of Dennis' songs of the time. Has as a sad song of loss and lost love. Straining vocals by this point. Sadly, Dennis's uh, overall condition was uh, maybe worse, but certainly no better than Brian's. Uh, so you got that straining voice, his voice isn't what it used to be, which is sad, but that sort of croaky, sleepy voice that he had toward the end of his life fit the songs that he was writing. So there's that um, and a tinge of sadness, loss, and melancholy to the song like there is to pretty much all of his songs of the last uh, you know, half decade or so of his life. 7.5, that's a, that's a good song. Okay, get to song number six. Well, one thing I will say about L.A. in its favor is that uh, the Idiot Boy, well, Brian Wilson is largely absent, unfortunately, and that's a bad thing, but the good thing is the Idiot Boy is pretty much totally absent from this album. I guess he sings some backup and uh, uh, does whatever whatever he does. But he does show up on one song that he wrote and sings. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, in, in tribute to the. Uh, that, there he is, uh, looking looking like a dumbass. And um, so yeah, Sumahama by Mike Love, the uh, least essential of the Beach Boys. Um, he had written a lot of songs in recent, in the 70s, especially about the Hawaii and Hawaiian islands and Hawaiian girls. Some of them were actually, to be fair, not bad. This one sort of trades that Hawaii motif for a Japanese motif, and he's singing about Japan and, a, I guess, a Japanese girl. The uh, song is boring, dumb, and lame. It's just surface, generic lyrics, kind of like those dumb songs where hey, rock and roll, and they shout out the name of a bunch of cities, like that type of thing. Uh, some music in the background that sounds like if you go eat at a Chinese restaurant where they got an all-you-can-eat buffet when they got that music playing in the background. Uh, and nothing else to say about this song. It's just pointless. I give it a one, and that's being generous. The embarrassment of the album, side two, opens with, um, and this is Brian Wilson's second and only one or two, or the, the, his own, they only had two writing credits on this album. This one doesn't really count because this is a writing credit from 1967. Here Comes the Night was a song on Wild Honey from 1967. On Wild Honey, it's a great song. Here it turns into a 11 minute disco song, The Beach Boys Doing Disco. Uh, so, yeah. 
um, Brian and Mike Love wrote the original back in 67 on the disco version here, Carl and Al Jardine sing. Um, so doing a disco song in 1979 was not the craziest idea in the world, I guess, because Paul McCartney, I mean, I'm, some of this, yeah, yeah, Blondie, you know, Heart of Glass, Paul McCartney with um, Good Night Tonight, Rolling Stones, Miss You, which worked. That's probably the last truly great Rolling Stones song that they ever managed. Uh, maybe you can make an argument that a couple of things from Tattoo You, Not Start Me Off, though. I hate that song. That's a terrible song. But, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, The Kinks, Superman off Low Budget. It's a great song. Uh, the Clash on um, Ivan Meets G.I. Joe, kind of a disco sounding song. Of course, that was, I think, 80. Disco had pretty much on its last legs by that point. But nonetheless, I mean, other people had done, other rock and roll people had done disco with some success or you know, varying to very good success. So it's not completely surprising that the Beach Boys would think, why not give it a try? How much interest the disco fans had in the Beach Boys in 79 and how much interest classic, well they would call it classic rock in 1979 yet, but it, it was still alive and thriving and not calcified and boring yet, but how much interest Beach Boys fans had in disco in 79, that's all debatable. Um, and if it worked, it'd be fine. It doesn't work, and it doesn't even work in a, this is so bad, it's like a train wreck that it's kind of interesting way, or this is so cheesy that it's sort of goofy and fun way. It just doesn't work. It, it's, uh, it, it's, just, it's just boring, and it goes on for 11 minutes, where the original song was uh, two or three minutes long. The original song was great. This has got the disco feel and all, but it's, and I was never really a huge fan of disco. I was, uh, 60s music and sort of new wave and punk stuff at that time and now I can look back on it and doesn't really make any difference but I'm still not a fan of that stuff uh, anyway this song is just it's just just pointless so I give that a, a one to uh, they only played that concert once because people disliked it so much that they gave it up really quick apparently but things, things look up on song number two. We got Baby Blue, uh, another second and last of the Dennis songs. Carl and Dennis sing. Carl sings lead. Another song of loss, uh, just missing someone. Tender affecting sort of uh, sad vocals. Um, I'm going to give that an eight. Probably my favorite song on this album, which is not a very good album, so that's not saying very much. But this is a, this is a good song. I'll give it as credit. And uh, number three song is called Going South, which is written by Carl, sung by Carl. It's kind of a song of wanderlust, being somewhere and wanting to be somewhere else, uh, either physically, geographically, or mentally, I guess. Great, great vocals by Carl. Good song. I'm going to give it a 7.5. Uh, the one thing I don't like about it is musically it sounds really good. It's got a good piano and all, but it's got that that crappy 70s saxophone, that sort of lounge music saxophone that was in so much of the mid to late 70s music, the kind of like Murph and the Magic Tones out of the Blues Brothers, just that cheesy, uh, or also the kind of the sound of what would in the 80s become, I called it that beer commercial saxophone playing that they had those stupid commercials for like Miller Lite where you know, you'd see some downtown and it's the middle of the night and the town's downtown's deserted except there's one idiot sitting there, you know, propped against a lamppost playing crappy saxophone. Not through the whole song, thank God, but only in bits and it's annoying when it shows up because the song is really good song otherwise. Uh, so yeah, good solid effort by Carl. Uh, nice lyrics and, and good vocals as always and a, and a pretty good song. The album ends on a weird song, Shortening Bread. You know, Mama's Little Baby's Got Shortening Bread, the old traditional song that dates back to late 1800s, early 1900s, old folk song. And for whatever reason, who knows why, Brian became obsessed with covering this song in the mid to late 70s, and apparently he had uh, recorded it over and over. There's several bootleg versions available. 
I don't know why you'd want to look him up, but um, he went to the point where he was hanging out with Iggy Pop and Elton John once, and he just kept playing it over and over to the point that Iggy Pop said, you know, this guy's crazy, i got to get out of here. Um, why the song so enamored him, who can say? I remember the song from being a little kid when they'd make you sing Swing on a Star with Moonbeams in a Jar and Row Your Boat, and I just always thought of it as that kind of stuff that you, you know, back when you were four or five years old type songs, but I guess it's an okay song, but um, I, I don't know. He was just obsessed with it, and he tried to record it for several albums before this one, and didn't like the results, I guess, and finally got something that he liked and put it on this one. Uh, and then the weird thing is, when he finally gets the recording he likes, he's not singing on it. I think he was on some of the other ones. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know why it's here. But I guess it's better than uh, the disco Here Comes the Night or Sumahama, so I will be generous and give it a 1.5. Uh, this album overall... There's a couple of things I like on it, I guess. I'll probably play it on rare occasions. I'm going to give it a... Because of the... I think there's three good songs on here, roughly. I'll give it a five. Probably should really give it a four, but I'll give it a five. Uh, don't rush out and buy this unless you just have to have everything the Beach Boys ever did. There's plenty of other great albums earlier than this to look into. So the next one, Be Up, will be their first release of the 1980s. I think it's called Keeping Summer Alive, if I remember correctly. I got it here somewhere. I'll be back to uh, review that sometime soon. Hope you guys have a good weekend.